you recall the last night, is it working all right? We talked about differences of perception and how difficult it is for people to communicate when they see really two different worlds. And one gentleman brought up the question, you didn't tell us how, what you do about this matter. And I said I'd discuss it all later. And so this is the later. I want to talk about the problems of communication among people who profoundly disagree. In the basic question, how can people be made to agree, we we'll ordinarily omit two words that ought to be there. The question ought to read, how can we make other people agree with us? For we all have our convictions of rightness, you understand, and almost by definition the peaceable kingdom in which the lion shall lie down with the lamb is that happy day when all you people who disagree with me finally come to me and say, I call you were right and we were wrong and that will be a nice time indeed. And therefore, underlying all our attempts to bring about agreement is the assumption that you, you bring about agreement by changing other people's minds. And so if you represent the union, you say management has got to realize. And if you represent management, you say the wage earner must learn. Or if you are a parent, you say it's high time Susan understood. And uh, if you are an international diplomacy, you say we must get the point absolutely clear to the Russians that so-and-so is so-and-so. And if you can only change their minds about those things about which they are so profoundly wrong, then we shall have peace on earth. Notice too that to describe a, an agreement successfully arrived at, we usually use tentative verbs like I persuaded him, I convinced him, I educated him. Or you can also say in psychiatry, I re-educated him. And the almost invariable assumption is that someone has to do something to somebody else in order to bring him to a realization of the truth. And hence the importance in Western civilization of rhetoric and persuasion, by means of which we straighten out these misguided individuals and bring them to a realization of the truth. In the public relations profession, where these matters are discussed at a more sophisticated level, they talk about the engineering of consent which is really a very frightening expression, but it's done to us all the time. Now, let's, uh, uh, let's examine this assumption a little more closely. The words we use to describe a communication successfully arrived at are transitive verbs, which, as every schoolboy tries to avoid learning, is the kind of verb that takes a direct object, such as the boy hit the ball, the shoemaker mended the shoe, the senator convinced his colleagues the missionary converted to heathen. And in these statement, statements, the subject, no, nothing is said about any changes in the subject, the boy, the shoemaker, the senator, the missionary. But drastic changes are taken, have taken place in the object of the sentence in each case, the, the ball, the shoe, the colleagues, and the heathen who having been converted, are no longer heathen. Now, Wendell Johnson has said that there is a way in which your language does your thinking for you. And in thinking about communication, we tend almost universally to take for granted the division of roles into the, into the active speaker and the passive hearer. The speaker is the one who does something, and the hearer is the one to whom something is done. Now, if this is a sort of basic unconscious assumption about communication then, it's clear that if I fail to communicate the first time, 
I have to do what I do more strenuously in order to get it across a second time. That is, you would say to your little boy, please close the door, son, and nothing happens. So what do you do next? You raise your voice. This is called Solution by Decibel. <laughs> you say, will you please close the door? And if he still does nothing, then you yell at him, damn it, close the door! You keep on. And then, the problem is this. If the act of communication is doing something to somebody, and the less you communicate, the more you have to do more of it. In 1950, President Truman announced that orders had been given to go ahead in the attempt, attempt to construct a hydrogen bomb. And at that time, the late Senator Brian McMahon of Connecticut gave an eloquent and moving address on the urgent necessity of taking new and unprecedented steps towards the peaceful resolution of differences between the United States and the USSR. And this is what he said. If a new crusade for peace is not the mission's objective, we must crack the iron curtain with our message of peace. We spend $29 million a year on what we are pleased to call the Voice of America. And we spend $35 million a year to advertise cosmetics. And $29 million, I repeat, to sell the precious commodity of freedom. I advocate, Mr. President, a United States program of attention-arresting broadcast that would compare in size and scope to the Soviet effort along this line that would genuinely deserve the name Voice of America. I explore, I wish to explore the efficacy of printing millions of leaflets for worldwide recirculation, explaining a United States proposal for atomic peace. Now I quote this passage with no attempt, intent to quarrel with the proposal, and there's certainly no arguing the fact that the distinguished senator was deeply concerned with peace. But it illustrates the universality of the human principle that when we don't get our message across the first time, you step up the energy. We increase the volume and intensity of our communicative efforts. So what if after you shout at your little boy three or four times, the little boy doesn't close the door. What if after repeated attempts to pierce the iron curtain with our message of peace, with a thousand instead of a hundred shortwave stations, with a billion instead of a few million leaflets, the Russians remain hostile and obdurate and sullen? The first thing that occurs to all of us, and the, and the only thing that occurs to some of us, is to replace verbal force with physical force. Force, in other words, is profoundly regarded as a technique of communication, a method of education. And as the stern parent says, sparing neither rod nor child, that will teach you a lesson. That will learn you. That will communicate that which verbally I was unable to communicate to you. But when the purpose of a communication is to bring about peace, a certain logical contradiction enters into such forceful methods of persuasion or education. It's the kind of contradiction that the detached observer might point out on seeing a father spanking his son while saying to him, that will teach you not to hit your little sister. And when the father becomes aware of the internal contradiction of this statement, and it sometimes happens, I speak autobiographically, <laughs> he is suddenly paralyzed with indecision. And so our national bewilderment in the face of international tensions and incidents is understandable. We have inherited from the past, not only we, but the rest of the human race, has inherited from the past a well-established pattern of how to behave when we want to change the attitude or behavior of other people. 
the pattern is to start out with words, friendly, cajoling, persuasive. Then when we find we're getting nowhere, we step up the energy level. We intensify the vigor of our communicative efforts and then we move on to the threat of force. And ultimately, if the threat of force doesn't move them, we apply force itself. So far as the ultimate force of the hydrogen bomb is concerned, we are concerned with the logic, to say nothing of the morality and the practicality, of starting a world war in order to prevent one. And most of us don't know what to suggest, except simply to scream against the necessity of war when we haven't really, really worked out basic alternatives. Because, after all, we are not the only warlike nation on Earth. There are lots and lots of them. And the human race, as I say, has inherited this pattern of trying to communicate by force. We've all had it for a long, long time. There's a terribly moving passage in Willard Motley's novel, Knock on Any Door. The central story is that of Nick, who is a young man in very great trouble with the authorities. At the end of the novel, he has been convicted of killing a policeman. And he, is been, he is sentenced to die for this crime. Central to Nick's troubled career is his hatred and resentment of his father whose educational methods can be inferred from his remarks when he learns of the terrible fate that has overtaken his son. He says, I can't understand it. I told him and I told him and I told him, and I always beat him when he did wrong. And the father feels, what else can you do? How do you communicate? You tell him and you tell him. You tell him again, if he doesn't mind, you hit him. What else is there? And even when he's confronted with a disastrous result of his educational methods, it does not occur to Nick's father to change those methods or to question their rightness. He merely feels as many fathers would that did the best he could. What else can a man do? And the tragic irony of deeply rooted patterns of behavior is that their victims don't question him either. Here's a terribly upsetting scene. In the death cell, Nick's aunt, Rosa, comes to call on him. And Nick says, how's Rosemary? Oh, she's just fine. And that kid of hers, he's a cute one. Aunt Rosa took a long time between each answer. And Nick asked, how's Junior? Oh, he's getting awful big, Nick, and bad. Aunt Rosa, will you do me a favor? Then embarrassed and staring at the toes of his shoes, Nick went on. Don't let him get too bad. Aunt Rosa, don't let him end up like me. Beat the hell out of him, Aunt Rosa. See that he does right. Now, in order to analyze problems of communication, I'd like to present a theory of personality, theory of how the human personality is structured. And I think I'll use the blackboard a little bit in order to diagram all this. As a result of such considerations as I have just presented, I found myself less and less concerned as time goes on, maybe this is a mistake, but less and less concerned with language as such, 
and more and more concerned with the totality of that human interaction which we know as communication. So what I'm going to try to answer tonight is the question, how do communications ever go through to anybody else? How does it ever happen? Why are some communications well sent? So that in some classes that you who are teachers have taught, they seem to, to learn even more than you taught them. It's like a group of eager kids. And other times you spend all this energy and they don't know anything. It's as if they put up a massive resistance against everything you're teaching. So why is it that some communications reach their target? Why is it that other communications are resistant? And in order to answer this question, I'd like to go into a theory of personality. Let me submit with Carl Rogers and others that human beings are not interested so much in self-preservation as they are in the preservation of what has been called the symbolic self or the self-concept. See, once you grant with Leslie White or Ernst Kassirer or Suzanne Langer or Alfred Korzybski or others, that human beings constitute a symbolic class of life, once you grant that much of human behavior is symbolic behavior, that almost all the rest of human behavior is conditioned, shaped, and mediated by symbols, then the idea of self-preservation as a law of life has to be modified for human beings. And we put it this way, that the fundamental motive of human behavior is not self-preservation, but the preservation of the symbolic self or self-concept. As Carl Rogers says, the basic purpose of all activity is the protection, maintenance, and enhancement of the self-concept. And the self-concept is an organized configuration of perceptions of the self admissible to awareness. Let me diagram this. With this fluid diagram, let me represent the changing dynamic process that is yourself or myself. We are not the same from moment to moment, week to week, month to month, year to year. But we do have an idea about ourselves, a self-concept, which I shall represent by this regular geometrical figure. And that pentagon, I shall, shall I say, is the self-concept. It's the organized configuration of perceptions of the self admissible to awareness. It is, that is, in other words, it's the sum total of all the things I say to myself about myself, which I organize into a more or less coherent system. It's the answer you're able to give to the question, who are you? You say, this is my name, this is my age, this is my height. And then I say, I'm thin or fat, tall or short. I like tennis, but I don't like golf. I like bridge, but I don't like poker. I pay my bets prop promptly. I'm a good mixer. I am poor at arithmetic. I shall never be a millionaire. I'm determined to become a millionaire. I am beautiful. Nobody loves me. I have less money than Bill, but more brains. I have less brains and build with more money, thank God. <laughs> or, I believe in discipline. Or, I'm not that kind of girl. And so on. And, whatever you say to yourself about yourself, it organizes your behavior. That is, if you are determined to become a millionaire, and that's what you say to yourself about yourself, that determines one way of acting. And if you say, I really don't care much about money, I'm more interested in art or culture or whatever, then you behave in an entirely different way. So the self-concept is, in a way, a guiding principle of all of us. 
And as Carl Rogers says, what we all do is to try to protect, maintain, and enhance the self-concept. Now, I want to put down those three words, protect, maintain, and enhance. No matter what you're interested in, we are all, we will remain more or less emotionally identified with our own interests. That is, if you are an enthusiastic golfer and someone wants to attack the game of golf with one terrible waste of time, then obviously you begin to mobilize yourself to protect this basic idea interest of yours from an attack from this stupid guy who doesn't like golf. And if you listen, for example, like Dixieland Jazz, and someone says that's old-fashioned junk, I don't know why anyone listens to it anymore, then again you may mobilize your defense and you say, well Dixieland Jazz is the best kind of jazz there is, etc., etc. We put up defense, we protect. Now, we like to maintain our self-concept. So that is, if you say, I like, I'm a good poker player, well, you'd like to create the occasions where you get a chance to play poker repeatedly so that you maintain your standing as a poker player. And then, furthermore, you want to enhance yourself as a poker player or as a art collector, or a fan for Dixieland Jazz, you expose yourself to those situations where you can improve your golf game, improve your poker playing, improve your Dixieland Jazz collection. If you believe yourself a real authority on French Impressionist masters, and there's an exhibition in town of French Impressionist masters, you're going to be there, sure as shooting, because you may get to know even more about the French Impressionist masters because you like to think of yourself that I'm the guy that knows about French Impressionists. And so we like to enhance our self-concept. Also, we protect our self-concept. Now notice that the self-concept can be described in Krasinskian terms very nicely. The map is not the territory. The self-concept is not the self. The map is not all the territory. The self-concept is not all the self. All of, us, all of us have great areas inside ourselves that we don't really know about. We are all capable of courage or cowardice or cruelty or saintly behavior in situations that we haven't been in yet and we don't know. And so, the map is never the territory, the self-concept is never the totality of the self. And also, and a very interesting fact, is that in the same sense that the map of a territory can be mistaken, the self-concept may be mistaken also. That is, at the same time that you say to yourself, I have great skills in business management, the company you are operating may be going to the dogs. Okay. And so, notice that we deceive ourselves about ourselves, and we also tell ourselves the truth about ourselves. And so I put part of self-concept in this diagram outside the self to indicate those areas of self-deception, those areas of error that we make in self-evaluation. For example, the man who says, I'm a born leader. And you look behind him and there are no followers. Now, if you say to yourself, I do not have a mathematical mind, 
I am poor at figures. It doesn't matter what talent you may have inherently, the fact that you said it to yourself and believed it will hinder your mathematical development for the rest of your life. You approach even the task of balancing your checkbook with a low degree of morale. And uh, if uh, the high school or college you go to offers very, very fine courses in algebra, trigonometry, or whatever else, analytic geometry, you will carefully avoid them because you define yourself as non-mathematical. So notice this is part of the protective business. Some of you, uh, well, we all have uh, had experience with, some of you are, can be described in this way, some people are just naturally poor spellers. Somehow they never get things right. And some of them are, some of these people are very bright in everything else, except that they don't spell well. And Prescott Lecky, who analyzed this problem very ingeniously, said that if a boy or a girl, for that matter, has incorporated himself within himself the idea, I'm a poor speller, then he's morally obliged to misspell a certain number of words per page. As Lecky says, everybody's got to be true himself, and the boy makes mistakes in spelling for the same reason he refuses to be a thief. Being a correct speller or being a thief would be both inconsistent with the self-concept. So we protect, maintain, and enhance our self-concept. And incidentally, for those of you who are teachers, I think it's a tremendously important thing to catch your students before they say, I'm no good at English. I never was good at arithmetic. Uh, social science, you know, I just never could understand. But you always had this, don't you have? The, the indexing principle in general semantics, English under Ms. Robinson, is not English and with Mr. Jones, see? English with Mr. Jones, if not English with Miss Kelly here. Seventh grade English is not eighth grade English. Elementary arithmetic is not algebra. Algebra is not trigonometry. So you index all these things and keep the world open to people. Now, Each individual then has his self, own self-concept. Each individual has his own way of organizing the reality he perceives. Each individual has his own way of extracting meaning from the world around him. And the meaning you extract from a given situation, as I pointed out last night, may be different from the meaning I extract. In the light of your self-concept, let us say, as a civil engineer and a practical man, and in the light of somebody else's self-concept as an esthetician and a believer in conservation, these two individuals may look at the same project for modifying the landscape with completely different conclusions as to whether or not it's desirable. Now, Donald Snig and Arthur Combs in their book Individual Behavior tell this curious little story which I always keep in my mind. They write as follows. Several years ago, one of them writes, I forgot which one of them wrote this. Several years ago, I was driving a car at dusk along the western road. Suddenly a large object, two or three feet in diameter, appeared suddenly in front of the car. My passenger in the front seat beside me screamed and grabbed the steering wheel attempting to steer the car around the object. I held on to the steering wheel and drove right into it. My passenger was from the east and he saw that shadow in the highway as a boulder. 
I was native to the southwest where we were driving, and I saw this tumbleweed. Now, from the point of view of the passenger, the driver was acting insanely. Driving right into that rock. From the point of view of the driver, the passenger was driving in insanely, but trying to alter the course of the car when there's nothing to worry about. From the point of view of either one, the other is acting insanely. But from within the frame of reference of each, each one is feels that he's doing the only sensible thing under the circumstances. Of course you've got to steer around that rock. Of course you've got to keep the car on the road. Who worries about a piece of tumbleweed? Hmm? Now, Sig and Combs say, and this I think is a terrifically important principle, everything that we do seems reasonable and necessary at the time we are doing it. From the point of view of the driver, it seems reasonable and necessary to drive right into that tumbleweed. From the point of view of the passenger, it seems reasonable and necessary to try to steer around it. At the moment of action, everything we do seems reasonable and necessary. Now, if the decisions that these people come to seem wrong to us or crazy to us, it's nice to remember that in the same way that everything I decide on seems reasonable and necessary at the time I decide on it, everything they decide upon, even if it's contrary to mine, seems reasonable and necessary to them at the time they decided on this course of action. Now, let's put two self concepts here. I never, I won't bother with another self here. Simplify the diagram a bit. Let's imagine two self-concepts here, Mr. A and Mr. B. And watch a communicative process in operation. Mr. A says to Mr. B something or other, makes a suggestion, gives a command, gives an order. Let's say for the time being that Mr. A is um, in some way or other in a superior position to Mr. B. He is manager, he is assistant manager, or whatever. See? But anyway, Mr. A makes the suggestion, and for some reason or other, Mr. B finds Mr. A's suggestion threatening to his self-concept. There can be a lot of reasons for it. Maybe he didn't like the tone of voice Mr. A used. Maybe Mr. A's suggestion ignored Mr. B's earlier suggestion of last week. It was made in perfectly good faith, but no one gave any feedback on it. Doesn't matter what reason, Mr. A, A's remark is threatening to Mr. B, so he puts up his defenses against it. And he says, in effect, not yes, sir, Mr. A, but he says, oh, yeah? Like that. Now, Mr. A, if he is easily threatened, may be threatened by Mr. B's resistance. I mean, Mr. A was, could feel, now, I wonder what's the matter with Mr. B, you know? Doesn't he realize I'm manager around here, and he's just the assistant manager, or whatever he feels. But anyway, some people get threatened when their orders are not carried out promptly, and so the defenses go up. So we go back to this whole routine I said earlier, and say it again, only louder. <laughs> and that only mobilized additional defenses on the part of Mr. B, which in turn, Mr. B, uh, mobilized Mr. A's defenses because, after all, he is manager, and Mr. B is resisting his authority, and that is very threatening if he doesn't feel secure about his authority. Another possibility is to say it to him in words of one syllable. 
then Mr. B may feel that his education level is being commented on, you see. And, and so, before you know it, these two individuals find themselves highly threatened by each other. And you have a condition which can be described as communicative deadlock. That is, a situation which may be very, may be very, very noisy because the men are shouting at each other, or it could be very, very quiet because they stop speaking to each other. But communicative deadlock is characterized by the fact that messages may be sent, but no messages are being received. No communication is taking place. This condition is easy to recognize. Whenever you hear such an expression as this, you give those fellows an inch and they'll take a mile. Probably a condition of communicative deadlock exists. The individual who says this is feeling threatened by the position of the other. And those people are being threatened by my position, and so on back and forth. And that is what the deadlock is. A dramatic example in recent history was the truce negotiation of Tan Mun Jong, where the deadlock continued for months and months and months because the felt press on each side was so enormous. Now, how do you break through when these are the circumstances? And here we come to this basic, basic semantic truism that listening is just as much a part of communication as talking. And that the very good listener is a facilitator of communication, just as is the very good speaker or letter writer. And so if Mr. A takes his position seriously, he can very well say something like this. I understand, Mr. B, that you don't like my idea. May I invite your comment on it? Right? That is inviting communication from B to A. And Mr. B, defensive and still angry, they say something like, well, well, it's just a damn fool idea, Mr. A. I'm sorry I can't go along with you. At this point, if Mr. A still feels threatened, he's going to give up listening. <laughs> but let's assume that he has some patience and strength. He says, I understand that you don't like the idea. You don't feel it's very sound. Uh, why? Won't you tell me? And Mr. B will say, he's still tense, you know. It'll never work, that's why. Again, you can give up. <laughs> and say, it's no use talking to guys like that. Or you might continue. And go on with this. Like, I understand that you believe this idea is totally impractical, but I still want to know, you know why you think it's so impractical. Mr. B, I really want your yeah. comment on it. And Mr. B may finally say something like this. Isn't that the same kind of oil we tried in Kansas City in 1964 and was such a flop? Now notice that the conversation has gone to a lower level of abstraction. Is this suggestion you made similar? The thing like that we did in Kansas City in 1964, is it or is it not? And suddenly the, the content of communication becomes not judgmental statements, it's a foolish idea, it'll never work, it's a question of information. In response to that kind of question, notice that other kinds of answers can be given. You can say, well, it didn't occur to me that this would resemble our experience in Kansas City, but uh, what are the resemblances that you see? And so Mr. B may continue to make his comment on Mr. A's original idea. But notice that if this begins to happen at all, Mr. B is 
giving his defenses relaxed. Because nothing relaxes on defense so much as being listened to politely with respect and patiently. You don't have to defend yourself against that. And Mr. A's defenses are going down too. That is, when discourse stops being at the level of it's foolish, it's wise, it's impractical, it's practical, it's good, it's bad, down to exchange of real information at lower levels of abstraction. Notice that people tend to calm down and their emotions are less involved and so ultimately information goes across and Mr. A says, I hadn't thought of that. Yes, I see what you mean. And there's a point in this discussion which I think is crucial in human relations when Mr. A says, you know, I still don't agree with you, but I see how you arrive at your conclusion. <coughs> when you say to the man with whom you disagree, I, I still disagree with you, but I see how you arrive at your conclusion, don't you see that you're admitting him to the human race? You are saying, in fact, you are a reasoning person. I didn't think so up till now. <laughs> but you are a rational being. I think I am, and therefore this com communication can continue. But, so Mr. B feels very happy to be admitted to the human race. Mr. B is happy that, um, that Mr. A is finally beginning to see the point of all this. And so the defense is going on on both sides. And this is true of all kinds of communication case situations. From this long string of whatever it is that Mr. B has said, Mr. A may learn something. Some little fact, some big fact, some circumstance that he didn't know about before. And if he has learned something from Mr. B, Mr. A is no longer A but A plus. Now, Mr. B being not threatened can now turn this thing around and say, Oh, Mr. A, what did you have in mind when you made this proposal? So now Mr. A has a chance to talk. Well, what I have in mind is something like this. And this is how we I, it didn't occur to me that it would be at all like our Kansas City experience, but uh, because these are the following differences. These are things we're planning. So, he, he keeps on talking and explaining his point of view, not defensively anymore, because Mr. B is non-defensive and accepting the flow of communication. And both these men being experience in the company, Mr. B will learn something that he didn't know before and at the end of this exchange of communication we have two wiser, slightly better informed men, Mr. A plus and Mr. B plus. Mm -hmm. And it's my, it's kind of out of faith with me that after successful communication takes place between any two individuals or groups, if each understands the world better as a result of this communication, A plus and B plus together can solve problems that are beyond the capacities of either A or B separately. But the ideas that emerge from such an interchange are a wiser solution to the problem because through the time-binding process, through the communicative process, we've got more information with which to devise our plans. Now, what I'm talking about then is really, really not compromise, because Compromise means Mr. A or Mr. B agreeing to something he doesn't really believe in, just for the sake of peace in the family. And I'm talking about when, Mr. when A plus and B plus get together is a kind of resolution of a problem 
at a higher level of integration. Now, whether you apply these terms or not, notice that all of us, all of you, succeed in this part of the time. You and your wife may have different views about something. Do you ask her what she knows about it and you listen? And she asks you what you know about it and you tell her and she listens. And then you get the whole body of information together and say, oh, is that so? And with the cumulated information that both of you have, you need to decide on a policy, a decision to make. One of you does this with the children. Very often, you know, we make decisions for children without listening to them at all. Because we are older, wiser, and bigger. Especially bigger. <laughs> very often you can make a very, very much wiser decision if you listen to the child before making it. Because communication is inevitably a two-way process. It requires speech. It requires communicative output. It also requires feedback, communicative intake, and constant interaction. The kind of thing I'm saying here is, a, in a way, a profoundly optimistic doctrine. In the following sense. See, most of the time, we feel about the terrible, awful people there are in the world, the stupid, the bigoted, the nasty people we're all worried about. But you know, there's, there, there's such bastards, there's nothing you can do about it. But if you really, really believe that human interaction can change the situation, then you can start setting up, at least trying to set up a communicative relationship with them, and try to find out where it is to make them feel the way they do, I understand what is the rationale for their mistaken act assumption, and so on and so on. And as you begin to understand, they themselves change because no one ever listened to them before. And see, the fantastic thing about interaction is that we all change when we interact. Well, I'm going to tell a story about it. Uh, a doctor uh, Frida Frohreich, a famous psychoanalyst, who was so good in work, working with extremely withdrawn schizophrenics. There was a situation in which there was a mental patient in a private hospital who, has, who was so really terrified of the world that he hadn't spoken to anyone in seven years. And people brought him his meals and tried to say good morning to him, he wouldn't reply. So they just left his meals and walked away. Well, Dr. Freya, Dr. Freya decided to take on this case herself. And so she took him his breakfast every morning to try to establish communication. And she would say something like, good morning, John. No answer. Nice day, John. No answer. No. I see the Sox won another game yesterday, John. No answer. Can you try one thing after Dr. Peter said, well, my grandchildren came to visit me, John. No answer. Well, I'll see you tomorrow, John. And she'd go back and then come, come the next day going through this whole routine again and not getting an answer, not getting an answer. But Dr. Frieda has, has this kind of ba basic faith in the interactional process. And it was it ultimately paid off in the following way. I don't know how long this continued, but one day John was expecting her and she didn't turn up. And so when she came the day after that was the pray, John was at the door just furious. He said, Where were you yesterday, you old bitch? <laughs> Don't you see, it may 
seems so true because after all he was afraid. But here he thought, finally, someone cares about him. But she missed it there. And he does he, he he doesn't trust people enough yet to say, I missed you, Frida. You know. <laughs> he can't. So all he can do, as many many disturbed people can do, and all he can do is attack, so he's we call her or we yesterday, you little bitch. But Dr. Frieda, of course, is wise enough to accept it right away. And the point is that that's the first thing he said to anybody in seven years. <laughs> so she picked him up on right away and communication was established and the therapy process was begun. And so, in a sense, the belief in the interactive process means, in effect, that the world is more changeable than we suspect. There are fewer incurable sons of bitches in the world than you think. <laughs> and to cure them requires, in a way, our patience, our exposure of ourselves mm -hmm. to them. Listening to them with respect, in spite of their mistaken opinions, despite the, in spite of their bigotry, in spite of their apparent stupidity, and so on, and listen and listen and listen. You can't do that, can you? Because most of us, trained in an aggressive culture, feel that listening is a waste of time. After all, why listen to people like that? Listening is, a, is an interruption of the fine flow of our own ideas. <laughs> <laughs> listening is passive, it's feminine, it's something that you are going to reserve for women and psychiatrists. For real man of action, he hasn't got time to listen. And so on. We have many, many ways of rationalizing. You know, are not listening. But notice that if you take our general semantics theory, Seriously, the map is not the territory. The map is not all the territory. Whatever I think I know about something is not all. There's always an etc. And that plays a value where they may provide some of the missing information that's the etc. in my life. And so to remain open the information then is to have the patience the humility, the basic respect for other human beings. It makes the communicating process possible. When communication has been blocked for a long time, it's not easy to get this instituted. Because very frequently we feel something like this. But you know, the problem between them and me is not one of communication, is not one of misunderstanding. I understand them all too well. And they sure know about me. And our purposes in life are completely incompatible. So by that is every now and then we get this point of view. But notice that what happens there very often is that when I say I know them all too well, I have been quarreling with them for so long that I have inferentially attributed to them all kinds of motives that they probably don't have. And they have attributed to me all kinds of motives that I probably don't have. But we return to be in the exchanges after using the motor for so long that we believe them to be, quote, fat, unquote. And I think the same kind of thing exists when Russian orators say, in effect, American imperialism has determined to destroy us and wipe us off the face of the earth. And what they say is a mirror image of oh, what many of our people believe, I mean, Russian communism is determined to wipe us off the face of the earth. Whenever you find two parties who disagree and saying almost exactly the same thing, then look out <laughs> for what may very well be deeply rooted misapprehensions about the other. Their lack has gone on for so long, they've acquired this 
ซึ่งสองพูดไปโค้ชมันเรื่อยเรื่อยบีสิกวีมันไม่ฟังเพราะที่อื่นไม่ได้ฟังไม่ถ้าเราจะมาดูบทสอบที่เราจะมาแสดงให้กันด้วยการแสดงอีกหนึ่งคลัสเตอร์ของตัวอย่างหนึ่งนั้นถูกให้ให้กับผู้สอนที่เป็นนักเรียนที่เป็นนักเรียนในโรงเรียนแคลิฟอร์เนียเขาชอบแบบนี้สองปีก่อนฉันได้รับการสนับสนุนจากการทำงานร่วมกับผู้สอนที่เป็นนักเรียนของแคลิฟอร์เนียเขาชอบแบบนี้สองปีก่อนฉันได้รับการสนับสนุนจากการ Was so great that I felt as if they had built an invisible wall between us, and they had suddenly become deaf and blind. So I dropped factions and went on something else. And the response was a busy, happy, working group of children. The problem then was to discover why it is that they resisted factions. So I waited until a small group of them stayed after school for an informal chat. At this session, they began to brag that nobody could teach them fact fractions. <laughs> not Miss S, their fifth grade teacher, not Miss E, and Miss R, who substitute for the time, and not even that curriculum coordinator who came in from Sacramento. <laughs> no one could teach us fractions. And being known as the only, every other sixth grade class had some basis of distinction, and being known as the only class that couldn't be taught fractions gave them prestige. <laughs> they thought that if they lost this thing, they would have nothing to satisfy their ego. And then the student quotes Carl Rogers: "The structure and organization of the self appears to become rigid under threat. To relax its boundaries when completely free of threat." So I waited a week or more before I made another move toward practice. One morning, I started verbal game with them, during which the word "fraction" was never mentioned. For example, dividing apples between two or more, having guests and serving pie. The fractions they figured out should be correct for each person. I wrote on the blackboard without comment. In a few days, they seemed to accept the fractions as meaningful symbols. The next was combining leftover pieces of pie for storage in the refrigerator. From this point on, they were eager to learn more about fractions. They had exchanged their self-concept. Nobody could teach us fractions. To a new self-concept, we learn we know about fractions better than any other sixth-grade class. <laughs> and so they began working alone in groups at the moment whenever they had time in school. Mary had just given her six-year-old Tim his breakfast. It's time for him to start off the school. Okay, Tim. Mom. Tim, here, let me help you with a jacket. Do I have to? Why? Walk. Well, of course you do. Why? Tim, it's a beautiful morning. The sun is out, and you'll have a marvelous time. No. Now don't be stubborn. I want you to walk. I want Daddy to drive you. But Daddy isn't going to drive you. Why? Now Tim, Daddy can take you where it's convenient. It isn't convenient this morning. I don't like to walk. Oh, how silly! I don't. Everybody likes to walk. It's good for you. <laughs> no. You can hurry up and walk with Eddie across the street. No. Or Jimmy. No. Or yourself. No. Can't go along because you'll be late if you don't get started. It's too far. Tim, now there's nothing wrong with you. It's only a block and a half up the street to your school, and you're such a big boy now. No. <laughs> well, you're walking. Is that clear? <laughs> I want to ride. Now, notice something about this interaction. There is no interaction going on because that mother is so damn determined to get that kid out of the house that she doesn't stop once past. I do want to ride. Why don't you want to walk? Now you never get the chance to say that. Think of a number of reasons they can be. He may be displaced by his little baby brother or sister. He wants to be reassured by us that Daddy still loves him. 
He may be ill. He may have had a fight at school yesterday. He doesn't want to confront that situation without a little strength in your morale. All sorts of things. And if you listen to the reasons, sympathize with them, understand them, he may be perfectly willing to walk after you listen. But notice how most of us behave. I, I love this little example because It illustrates so beautifully what so many of us do so much of the time. We're in a hurry, we have purposes to achieve. As soon as taking us off to school, I got something else to do. So you don't take the time. Listen. Now, maybe I'll wind this up with two little examples. Burn in England, March 3rd. Members of the Young Conservatives here have been advised not to invite members of the opposition Labour Party to their meetings. The order was issued after a group of young Tories invited a Labourite to their meeting and he converted the entire group to socialists. <laughs> Sometime this thing can go too far. <laughs> Here's another nice example. Canary Italy, March 3rd, a piece. Giuseppe Gallo, an old man of marriage, advised new husbands today never listen to your wife. The sturdy 96 year old said that that's how he and his wife, 92 year old Josephina, arrived happily at their 72nd wedding anniversary. Well, I believe in all fairness that the opposite point of view from now on could be stated. And this is just a big gallo theory that you should never, never listen to your wife because that's the way to a happy marriage. <laughs> Do you take sugar with your tea, said the hostess? No, said the little man. Yes, said his wife, and turned to her husband reproachfully, but I always put sugar in your tea. Yes, he said, I used to tell you not to, but now I just don't stir. <laughs> so we take a break for about five minutes? <laughs> Several of you last night after I read my paper on the telecacks and the San Francisco Giants. Several of you who are connoisseurs of great prose have asked if they could have copies of it. And so here are a few copies, which we did diddled off in the department today, and please feel yourself free to help yourself to them. I guess we're ready to proceed with your comments and questions and arguments. Does anyone have a speech coming on? <laughs> Sir? In a situation such as you illustrated with A and B, yes. do you have any recommendations for B behavior if A transmitter has no off switch? <laughs> A is in this situation, uh, sort of a monologue that you can't stop him, is that it? Yes, and if you, you try to stick words in, he just raises the decibel level and he sort of goes. you've tried walking away. Well, the situation is as you describe it. Oh, you're the assistant manager. <laughs> Have you ever tried this to interrupt by saying, may I try to reformulate what you just said and see if I got it clearly? Yes, the decibel level just goes up and he doesn't hear. Are you sure of this, that you really tried asking him if, may I restate what you just said, to see if I'm understanding you clearly? 
Because that's, uh, that's in a way, a stopper. There isn't any. Ever tried kicking him in the shins? <laughs> yeah. Well, I really don't know the solution to this because, after all, we all experience it in one situation or another. Uh, there certainly are some people you can't turn off. Yeah, have someone call in and call and tell him that he's wanted on the telephone. There's a long distance message from Miami, Florida. I don't know what to do, really. There are some people, by the way, I mean, this, this is a question. That, there are some over-verbalized people. Uh, whom you can tactfully make aware of their own over-verbalization. Uh, it takes some patience on your part, but sometimes you can do it by little overdoing a little bit the atmosphere, uh, the attitude of respectful attention. Okay. That's a sneaky oriental trick. Try that sometime. <laughs> lecture about levels of abstraction. There are many people with whom we differ at one level of abstraction we can get together with at other levels of abstraction. And one of the profoundly important things about a democratic society and parliamentary system and all the forms that we go through is how to get along with each other despite the fact that we may have very profound disagreements in some respects. This is what we mean, is it not, by a pluralist society. So if I'm a political conservative and you're a political radical, or vice versa, notice that decisions to be made at the federal level, the state level, the city level, the local school board level, you know, and so on and so on, all involve different factors about which we may communicate. And so we may very well agree on what to do about the local grade schools at the same time as we disagree about what we ought to be doing in Vietnam. And so long as this goes on, we can keep in respectful touch with each other despite larger disagreements. We can even serve on a committee together to put through the school, the school plan at the same time as the rest of the time we quarrel about Vietnam or something else, you see. And so, is this not the technique of learning to live together that we slowly worked out over the centuries in parliamentary and democratic tradition of how we can disagree and still agree at the same time at other levels. This is the genius. Now this is one thing that has bothered me very, very much about uh, many of the anti-Vietnam people, and I think there's some people on the other side of whom the same kind of thing can be said, is that if you disagree with me about Vietnam, then you're an outright son of a bitch and I can't uh, cooperate with you about anything else on the, in the world. See. Uh, that kind of attitude 
is frequently found on the extreme left is also found on the extreme right. See? If you do not agree with me, you know, that Eisenhower is a communist, then you're a communist too and I can't possibly work with you, and so on and so on. Now, that kind of extremism we must avoid, must we not? And if we can avoid it, then, as I say, you can be very conservative, I can be very radical, and we can still serve on the school board together, you know, etc., etc. Work out mutually a plan for garbage removal in our city. All sorts of things have got to be done, regardless of what our disagreements are at higher levels of abstraction. Yes? Professor, this hypothetical professor feel? This professor feels that any idea that you have that disagrees with it. Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know what you do. You feed, feed the guy back his own line in his examination question, pass the course and get the hell on to something else. <laughs> Isn't that what you do? In all this business of trying to get negotiations going with North Vietnam, think how often we've appealed on both sides, see, to people who aren't involved in the war one way or another, like people like Romania or uh, one of the African nations, to see if any of these third parties can't be in go-between in getting some communication going. Is this the kind of thing you mean? I think this is a normal procedure. Another very interesting thing, is that if you have the task of approaching a very, very important person, you often don't quite dare to do it directly. Because you feel, I'm just a little unimportant person, and he's such a big shot, I still want to get the message through to him. How do you do that? Well, very often you do it by approaching his secretary or some intermediate person, do you not? and then hope that the message gets taken the rest of the way. So that intermediaries in the communicative pro in communication process are, you know, part of the very necessary machinery whenever communication problems arise. This is why, for example, in some places they're talking about the ombudsman. Isn't that right? It's another idea applying the same principle. Sometimes it makes me very sad to think that there's so many people in the world who have no one to talk to. If, let us say, they are misunderstood by their wives and children, or, or their husbands and children for that matter, and they have no friends that they can really profoundly trust, a lot of people lead lives of lonely and quiet desperation. And uh, ultimately they have to pay someone to listen to them like psychiatrists. You know? Yes? Have you ever thought of um, yourself as 
yourself as a, a possible mediator in international It's very nice that you've asked the question, but also, may I say that there are special conditions and conventions about international communication. There's also a kind of knowledge required, background knowledge, for which I'm not professionally trained. Now, I have read as much as I can of accounts of how Averill Harriman operates. And he sounds to me, from all the accounts I've read, like an extraordinarily skillful listener. At the same time, one who firmly holds to a position, but you know, knows how to lay things out and give other people the opportunity to make statements and back and forth. I think that we have quite a few people in government in all countries who have these skills to a remarkable degree. But I think that Mr. Harriman has them to a superlative degree. So, if there's any problem of international communication, if there's anything to be learned about international communication, it's I who should go to Mr. Harriman, not the other way about. <laughs> Sir. I think you uh, substituted an intermediary for an innocent bystander. I did, didn't I? Mm -hmm. No, they're not the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you better keep out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I remember very clearly once when a man was actually, I was living in a rooming house when I was a graduate student, a man was actually beating his wife. Horrid sounds are coming through the partitions, you know. And I, I, you know, I, I thought some, I had to do something, but the moment I tried to even speak to them, they just both turned on me simultaneously. Go out of here! <laughs> None of your damn business! And they went back to fighting. So I guess <laughs> nothing you can do about it. Yes, please. I'm not going to answer your question directly so much as discuss the whole problem of school integration a little bit, if you permit me. This may answer your question. I think that far too many of us have taken stands at too high levels of abstraction about integration. That is, in principle, most of us here, I'm sure, would like eventual integration of schools and the elimination of racial differences as a basis for special treatment or special discrimination and so on. We'd like to see that. But the integration of a particular school in a particular neighborhood with a particular balance of populations that you have is always a difficult thing, even if they're all white kids being integrated with other white kids. Supposing there's a difference of income level between the people on this side of the tracks and that side of the tracks, see? So that there's a social division between their parents don't know each other, and still they're forced into the same school. They very often have very great difficulty simply as a result of this fact, see? Now, integration, therefore, and then there can be also very sharp cultural differences. Uh, 
There's certain school districts I know of in California where unprejudiced parents have highly prejudiced children because they were put in integrated schools. They encountered real tough lower class Negro kids in the school who gave them such a bad time that they come out of these schools with heavy prejudices against the Negroes. See? Now, in this particular school district I'm speaking of, a lot of good-hearted people just insisted upon this integration without sufficient study of the background culture of both the white children and the Negro children involved and without sufficient training of the teachers who are going to handle this. Uh, from, the point of, from this point of view, very special training is necessary for the teachers in this new situation too. But all they did was just force this through on the basis of a kind of good-hearted liberalism and did not predict because they had not made adequate sociological and educational other studies, you see, of what would be the outcome. And therefore I think that it is possible, quite possible, at one level of abstraction to believe in integration another level of abstraction to say not this particular integration plan in this particular school district in this particular year. See? And I think this about fair housing and all sorts of other things. Fair housing is a wonderful thing in abstract principle. I think it's an easier one than integration by far, but we tend to discuss it in highly unrealistic terms without sufficiently considering the extensional situation in one community, another community, in this, that, and the other social situation, don't you see? I hope you don't feel that I'm pussyfooting on, on this issue, but I, I do want to call your attention to the fact that there are real differences at levels of abstraction. And I think the most important kind of attitude to take is to have the high-level abstractions firmly in mind. In the long run, you want an awful lot of integration all over the place, see. And therefore, in the short run, you've got to do what you can, and you mustn't spoil the chance of future in integration by rushing too quickly into, a situa into an unwisely thought out or an unthought out plan. Does that, am I answering your question, Tom? Okay. I'm going to take one more question, then we'll call it an evening. Hmm? Anybody? Yes, please. The question is, what part do your, does your unconscious or your daydreams or fantasies have upon your behavior and so on? Is that it? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, Delmore Schwartz wrote a book once called In Dreams Begin Responsibilities. This is a phrase that's always fascinated me. The daydreams you have of what you would like to be, what you would like to do, what position you'd like to occupy in the world 10, 20 years from now, these in a way are very, very much part of your self-concept. You may not tell others about them. You may only say it to yourself. But still they are determinants of your behavior, are they not? And I think the startling thing is that for an awful lot of people, dreams do come true. You know, people who wanted to become successful businessmen have become successful businessmen. <laughs> I wanted to become a writer and I became a writer. But there was a long period during which it was an idle dream way off in the distance, after all. And therefore, let me go on to another step. This is why I believe very, very strongly 
in good courses in literature. Because literature is what day dreams are made of. I believe in good movies. Okay. I believe in good drama, good, mu good music. Art is the stuff out of which we ultimately make our daydreams. And as we read biographies, histories, fantastic characters in novels, plays, and so on, we say to ourselves, that's the kind of guy I'd like to be. That's the kind of woman I'd like to be, and so on. I don't believe much in censorship of literature, but I believe in the school systems the, that in public entertainment there's not enough attention paid to the effects upon people's daydreams of the kind of literature they're exposed to, for example, on the television screen or in the movies. If we really understood what, lit what literature does to people, you know, maybe we'd lay off on some of the stuff that they show. Also, I want to criticize English departments a little bit, that very often they include in the English curriculum books that are important as great literature by literary standards and omit a large number of less important literary works that are important in the development of the adolescent mind, important in developing self-insight on the part of young men and women. And these may not be by famous authors at all, but they do enable on the part of young men and women a kind of imaginative role-playing in realistic life situations, see. I think one author that I used to teach in freshman English for a long time, when I was a beginning teacher at the University of Wisconsin, I was always impressed with the impact it had. And that book was Sinclair Lewis's Aerosmith. I'd, it's totally unfashionable to speak of him these days, and in literary circles, you're supposed to say St. Clair Lewis with a sneer. But the idea that this is what a medical student does, this is what a, a, a young kid you know, from a small town does if he suddenly decides he wants to become a scientist, a real research scientist. And my students at the University of Wisconsin, you know, built up daydreams about this. I'm sure it was good for all of them to have empathize with the career of Martin L. Smith, you know? And there ought to be lots more books like that that describe extensional American situations see, and American possibilities of life and career and problems and hardships and political situations and so on for young people to see themselves in. And they don't have to be Dostoevsky, see? They don't have to be Shakespeare. They have to be to give material for constructive daydreams for the for young people. Does this answer your question at all? The whole problem of daydreams, it seems to me, is that there's a dangerous borderline. On one side of day, one side daydreams are preparation for the future, they're the building of your career. See? On the other side, daydreams are escape from immediate present responsibility. See? And uh, so you have pleasant daydreams, but you do nothing toward fulfilling them. And daydreams can be an es escape. I think these two should be sharply distinguished. You know. Good night.